Okay, um, then let me get started. Um, welcome this morning, this afternoon, this evening for wherever you are around the planet. My name is Stefan Schweinfest. I'm the director of the UN Statistics Division and I'm very, very happy to welcome all of you, many of you, we are at 160 right now, uh, to this high level panel on the future of population data systems. Um, I'm very happy to thank uh, the distinguished speakers that we have. We have sort of, a, I would call it a population dream team here together. Uh, we have, of course, our wonderful colleagues from UNFPA with whom we uh, uh, co-organized this event and uh, we organize uh, many things together. I just recently was welcome very well in their building for our expert group meeting on the uh, new round of population censuses. And um, we have, of course, uh, distinguished speakers from national perspectives, the global north and south, private sector, academia, and all of you around the table. So this promises to be a really interesting event. It is the third high level discussion on our way to the 55th session of the United Nations Statistical Commission that starts in two weeks. And I'm very happy that we have the opportunity of these virtual events to bring all of the people together. And these side events are a little bit more relaxed in a way compared to the official commission session. Uh, we can throw around innovative ideas. Uh, we can brainstorm here. We can develop visions and and I think that's exactly the purpose of uh, the event this morning. We all understand we have a policy background, our sustainable development goals, and there are all these three pillars of the environment and the economy and the social population dimension. And I think we'll focus on that last one uh, because people at the end of the day are really at the center of everything uh, we are doing. And um, I think it is uh, a good moment to reflect on uh, the future of population data systems and also how they interact with the environment and the economy. So we have, as I mentioned, a very diverse group of stakeholders here, and that is uh, very interesting and that allows us uh, to look at the whole landscape of population data and a variety. I think there are perhaps two things that have changed in the last couple of years uh, that drive this reflection. One is uh, we have many more data sources, a large variety of data sources, and we start with our uh, classical traditional tools like census and surveys, but we also have administrative records, geospatial information, big data, many other citizen generated data, many other non-traditional data sources. And we have to reflect on how we bring all of this together in an effective architecture. And then of course, the second big push um, is the technological advancement. We can do things today that nobody could dream of 10 years ago, but we always have to reflect how we use these capabilities uh, responsibly. Uh, I always say I like my Superman principle, uh, um, with great powers come great responsibilities. So, uh, and as a UN, we uh, never start from scratch. We put a table in the middle of the room and invite all distinguished guests and experts. And we uh, build on that, build on national experiences, on, on experiences in our stakeholder sectors and so on, bring all of this together. And um, as my colleagues know, I don't like to write read speaking notes, but I will read at the end one sentence which I really like and what my colleagues have prepared. I think we will we are here together to accelerate the transition towards a population data model that is fit for the future. So in that spirit, welcome. Thank you again for connecting and uh, simply enjoy this event this morning. Thank you. And I turn over to Francesca Groom my head of the demographic and social statistics program to lead us uh, through the day. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Stefan, and a very uh, warm welcome from me too. Uh, we will indeed discuss uh, with our distinguished panelists uh, some of the current trends that will probably continue to characterize the evolution of population data systems. And we will also touch on the potential challenges uh, that will have to be addressed, uh, including by ensuring uh, 
an enabling environment for this modernization and transformation of population data systems uh, to actually materialize uh, in all countries. Uh, so before I introduce our distinguished uh, uh, panelists, uh, let me just uh, say a couple of uh, uh, things I want to highlight. Please do not change the language of the captioning. The language needs to be set to English. And uh, I would also like to remind you to uh, use the chat box to add your observations, uh, to share your experience, uh, and of course, uh, to ask questions for our panelists. So, but uh, let me uh, quickly introduce uh, our speakers. Um, I'm very pleased to have with us today Statistics Canada. We have uh, Jose Began. Uh, she is the Assistant Chief Statistician of the Social Health and Labor Statistics field at Statistics Canada. Uh, Jose, in her current role, uh, she supervises uh, uh, the overall statistical planning and coordination of statistical activities. Uh, in domains like the labor force survey, the disaggregated data action plan, Canada's quality of life framework, as well as the content of the population census. We also have with us uh, Federico Segui. Uh, Federico is the deputy director general and the data steward and chief data officer of the National Statistical Institute of Uruguay. Uh, where Federico is also responsible for the implementation of the integrated system of statistical registers and surveys. Thank you, Federico. Uh, we are also very pleased to have Linda Peters. Uh, Linda is a cartographer and GIS analyst with over 30 years of experience working in the geospatial industry, including for ESDRI for almost 20 years. Linda today works with national statistical offices across the globe, helping them understand how to apply geographic methods and GIS to census and statistical activities. And we have uh, Andy uh, Tatum, who is a professor of spatial demography and epidemiology at the University of Southampton and is the director of WorldPop. Uh, Andy, uh, in his research, has led um, uh, his research has led to pioneering approaches to the use and integration of satellite, survey, cell phone, and census data to map the distributions, uh, demographics, and dynamics of populations for disease, disasters, and development applications. And we have Eugenia uh, Giraudi. Eugenia is a research scientist in the computational social science team at Meta. Uh, she leads a team of researchers uh, focusing on understanding how big data can help humanitarian organizations, governments and academics on a wide array of topics such as migration, natural disasters, economic development and climate change. And finally, uh, we have uh, our colleague Alessio Canjano. Alessio is a technical advisor for census and demographic data with UNFPA's uh, Population and Development Branch. And in his uh, current role, uh, he oversees uh, UNFPA's uh, Global Census Program, and he's the lead author of UNFPA's forthcoming policy paper on the future of population data systems. So Alessio is really our per perfect discussant uh, uh, for today's discussion. Um, so let's uh, move uh, to our first set of questions. Everybody looks uh, very ready. Uh, so starting with you, Jose, uh, with Statistics Canada, as a country with a mature national statistical organization, what are some of the lessons learned uh, you can share with us about developing an integrated population data system? Thank you, Giuseppe. Thank you, Francesca, and thank you for inviting me. I'm very pleased to be here with you all today. Um, I think I want to start my answer by building on experiences around the Canadian census. So uh, it was established over 350 years ago. There's a lot that has changed since then. Um, and initially, we were conducting our census every 10 years. 
And if I use an example in the late 1800s, uh, early 1900s, um, we had a boom in agriculture in Western Canada that drew hundreds of thousands of immigrants in a very short period. So our Western provinces uh, were the first ones to implement a five-year census to capture this growth. And the rest of the country uh, followed suit after that, adding also a constitutional uh, requirement to hold a census in the 1950s. So a lesson that we've learned is the importance of getting the right balance between the frequency and the granularity of our measurements. And I'm using the census as an example. So more frequency allows us more meaningful comparisons over time, better captures changes at the population level like growth or social trends. The pace of change is also accelerating and we need to be timely to stay relevant. But we've also heard very clearly, especially at the beginning of the pandemic, that we cannot just settle for national averages. We need to look deeper, and that's where the stories are. That's what policymakers need for tailored responses to the challenges of the day. So whether it's health or unemployment, we have to look deeper to understand differences between population subgroups, between places as an example. We also need to stay nimble to keep up with uh, social change. So for example, Canada became the first country to collect data on gender diversity in a national census in 2021. Reflecting the diversity of our evolving society allows us to better plan, to better allocate and deliver services to communities um, where we like more that communities that are more vulnerable, uh, for example, to discrimination and harassment. So another lesson for us is uh, leveraging existing administrative data. So you could think of it in terms of um, saving money, but also reducing uh, response burden. So uh, another example is in our census, um, instead of asking financial question on income, we are integrating uh, our responses from the census with income tax records. So we know that the quality of income uh, from income tax records is better. It saves time uh, to our respondent. And then it also gives us a little bit more space on this census in terms of real estate to add uh, other questions. So we're also using this method of data integration uh, with other programs that we have to address data gaps that we encounter, especially as the pathways into uh, Canada's diversity evolve. For instance, uh, Canada's non-permanent residents are historically underrepresented in our uh, census coverage. So by relying more heavily on administrative data from our border services agency, we are using record linkage uh, to understand the characteristics of non-permanent residents and also to gain a better understanding uh, of whether they return home uh, and their retention rate in Canada. And I'd like to end by um, also maybe mentioning a little bit that uh, our work through supporting the Friends of the Chair of Social and Demographic Statistics has leaned into the foundational role of demographic statistics within the social statistics pillar. And demographic statistics are a crucial foundation for policy making, as I was uh, explaining earlier, tracking quantity and characteristics of people over time, but also across locations. Social statistics seek to understand how those people are doing in terms of their quality of life, their standard of living. And recently, uh, we've also seen a big shift in how we approach social statistics, like a push to measure well-being beyond traditional measures such as the GDP. So measuring outcomes for different groups of people across places and over time in consistent ways is the foundation for an integrated social pillar with demographics at its heart. And we think that there is an important role for multilateral collaboration like the Friends of the Chair work in setting standards and driving overall coherence 
while retaining domestic flexibility. So I'll stop here, Francesca. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jose. Uh, you already uh, mentioned uh, a few of the key dimensions that we would like uh, to further explore with, with the speakers, with our panelists. Uh, I just want to mention the fact that you bring us uh, to the discussion on leveraging uh, administrative records and how important that component is uh, uh, as we um, envision the future of population data systems. But I also wanted to pick up on this Friends of the Chair group that you just mentioned, Friends of the Chair on Social and Demographic Statistics, and for uh, the colleagues uh, in the room with us who are interested in learning more about uh, this new initiative of the Statistical Commission, uh, I would invite you to please uh, uh, go to the Statistical Commission website because uh, there will be an agenda item, uh, there will be a report prepared by the Friends of the Chair and you can learn, uh, um, and you can have a sense of where we are going and what we are proposing uh, uh, there too. Maybe my colleagues uh, can put a link uh, uh, in the chat uh, uh, for those of you who are interested uh, um, in that work. But let's move to Uruguay. Uh, Federico, you are ready. Uh, so a question for you too, uh, building of course on uh, also what Jose just said. Uh, can you briefly describe uh, Uruguay's approach to implementing uh, an integrated population data system and uh, sharing the experiences uh, of uh, your country? Thank you. Thank you, Francesca, for the, the question. Um, in, in Uruguay, we are traveling to parallel paths. Uh, on the one hand, we are implementing an administrative central population register, which is a, a register of population and usual place of residence established by law in 2021. But we know this will take a long time to be fully operational. Uh, in, in, in the meantime, in parallel, at the NSI, we have a created a statistical population register from the integration of various administrative registers uh, from, from different institutions. In, in fact, we have uh, created an integrated system of statistical registers and surveys. Um, let me, let me uh, uh, use a, a, a short uh, presentation uh, to, to tell you uh, more about, about this. Uh, Sorry. Uh, okay. Um, okay. Here we are. I think um, it, it, it is important to know the, the, the context and some key elements of the uh, Uruguayan case. Um, in Uruguay, there is a unique ID number of population with universal coverage. Moreover, we, we have a, a national ID identity card to use this ID number everywhere for every register in, in the country. Also, institutional capacity, trust in the public institution, in particularly uh, the, the, the National Statistical Institute, uh, low informality in the context of, of Latin America, which means good coverage of administrative registers, a strong social security system with universal coverage. We have a government interoperability platform to share data among public institutions, availability of good quality of registers, vital populations, and others. And, 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 and the integrated uh, information system on social areas, CIAS, from the Ministry of Social Development, comprising of more than 60 administrative registers from, from 15 institutions, social security, health, education, etc. Which it, it has been a, a great starting point um, Chile uh, is an integrated system of statistical registers, but also census and, and surveys. It is based on, on the model of the Scandinavian countries, which is made up of three base registers, population, businesses, and, and, and real estate. Um, one of, of, of the most important base registers of the CIRES system is the population register. Uh, mm, uh, we are using these sources of, for the population based register. Uh, as I mentioned, the main source is the CIRES system from the Ministry of Social Development. It is not only a register of beneficiaries of social programs, but also integrates records of people from different uh, public institutions, such as uh, health, education, social security. Uh, social programs, housing, and also with the national population register 
uh, from the authority responsible uh, for, for issuing the national person, personal ID cards. Um, when we receive this data, we integrate this information with other registers like migration, birth, and death, and uh, to, 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 to adjust uh, our over coverage and uh, under coverage. And we also uh, uh, use the, the concept of sign of life. So we search persons in different registers uh, to see if they are uh, 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 still alive uh, or, or are still residents in, in, in the country. And then my recommendation is accelerating data integration by liberating existing initiatives or, or promoting new ones for public management and decision making like this SIA uh, system uh, from the Ministry of Social Development, even without highlighting the potential statistical use of, uh, it would have for, for, for the NSO. Uh, finally, uh, uh, let me let me tell you that in 2023, we conducted a pilot register uh, based census in parallel to the traditional census in order to, to compare both sources, taking into account the, the, the same the same reference period. Uh, and, and we tested uh, our statistical population register and our integrated system of statistical register. The, the objectives were uh, evaluate the coverage and quality, establish the current gap between the traditional census and registers, compare both sources. Uh, for record linkage, we asked for the personal ID number in the census questionnaire. Uh, so it is the, the, the starting point for annual update of, of census in, information. I don't have time to, to talk about the, the details of the register based census pilot, but the, the results are very encouraging and inspiring. At this moment, uh, we have uh, our first population count based on the administrative registers. Uh, we have a, a difference on, on, on 0.4 percent with the traditional census, taking into account uh, the census no response and, and omission estimation. Um, in fact, we are exploring the possibility of including some data from administrative registers in the traditional census to cover a non response and, and no coverage, which would make it uh, the first combined census in, in, in Latin America and the Caribbean. Uh, let me finally tell you that uh, we have a, also an MOU with, uh, on, on technical assistance with Statistic Norway. The, the, they have conducted an assessment of our pilot register based on census, and we received the, their comments and recommendations. They visited Uruguay, and we have a, a visit study uh, to Norway last week. Uh, we are very grateful with, with them uh, for its support and cooperation, and we are exploring the possibility to provide triangular cooperation with third uh, countries also. Thank you. Thank you, Federico, and congratulations. Uh, this is a huge progress, uh, and I'm, I'm sure that uh, our colleagues uh, following the discussion will have uh, questions <laughs> for you, um, and we'll have time for that uh, uh, towards the end of this session. Just want to point out also that you were lucky in the sense that the enabling environment was there. You touched on the fact that there was uh, capacity at the country level. The NSI, the National Statistical Institute, uh, can uh, really enjoy uh, high trust in public institutions, but particularly in, in your office. Uh, and there was already a, a very good level of uh, data interoperability. So I think that was the ideal situation. But, you know, uh, having said that, there was a lot uh, of uh, I, I assume negotiation coordination for the full uh, integrated uh, information system uh, uh, to be implemented. I also like that you mentioned uh, towards the end uh, that the way to sell it to all the stakeholders, you worked with 15 uh, different uh, agencies, uh, was to highlight uh, that you were improving the cost efficiency and the way uh, um, uh, as a whole, the government was providing uh, services uh, to citizens uh, and you were keeping uh, the gain uh, in terms of statistical production as the byproduct that was not so highlighted. Uh, I think that was also a strategy that maybe others uh, uh, may wish uh, to follow. But um, let's uh, go on uh, with our uh, uh, speakers and um, let's turn uh, to Linda. Uh, Linda, um, how does geospatial information enhance 
data integration across diverse sources uh, in the context, of course, of population data systems. And are there any specific shortcomings or challenges? Yeah, great, great question, Francesca. And I'm going to share my screen and, and share a couple of slides here as I talk. Um, this is a really important topic. Uh, you know, as we think about the challenge for statistical agencies, it really is to facilitate the integration of all these different data sources and and promote interoperability. Um, and you know, add to that the fact the external data producers and data users today are you know increasing increasingly exchanging their own data right amongst themselves. So um, it really, it, I think, underscores the importance of the global statistical geospatial framework. And we all understood this in the industry when when we proposed this, right? Uh, this idea um, and the examples you see on screen really uh, exemplify the value of using location to be able to represent data accurately. And we need to be able to combine it with other relevant data and um, do so using a variety of different types of information products. Now, GIS. Um, creates really that common ground that allows us to do that. It allows us to think about all the different factors, right? And, and we know this from our work. It's not just looking at economic data or environmental data or social. It's really bringing all of that together. And the language of geography, the, the science of geography, are the perfect foundation for organizing all of this information and understanding the complexity of the situation that we're dealing with. It really helps us simplify it and um, understand patterns bring those patterns to life. So we like to think about what we call the geographic approach as geographers. Um, a location and geospatial really helps us um, strengthen the ability of these national statistical systems to collect their data, produce it, manage it, and share it to meet the expectation of citizens and, and society and really accelerate data integration. Um, as we think about that framework, and you can see the arrow there on the screen, um, if we include location in our data from the point of collection, from the point of measurement, then we can visualize it, we can map it, we can analyze it, and we can predict using location as the foundation in our work. And I wanted to touch on your, your last part of the question on the shortcomings or the challenges, if you will. I think the real challenge here is to leverage location using those common geographies right uh we think about there are so many different types of data sources out there today you know um you know traditional uh point information is just one type right tabular data but if we think about all the vector data the unstructured data new things um we'll talk about that in a little bit um such as geoai giving us uh ability to leverage things like point clouds and LIDAR data, um, all of these help us together in our work. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Linda. And uh, we'll keep talking about uh, geography for sure. But I, I love that you said that the language uh, and the science of geography can really allow us to, to bring all the dimension, uh, being economic, environmental or social, uh, uh, together and of course the power of having information on location. But um, let's go on and uh, um, I'd like to invite uh, Andy also keeping the discussion on geospatial but you'll bring in uh, this additional element of modeling. So can we envision geospatial modeling uh, reducing the need for real world uh, or real life uh, population data? What are the potential benefits and risks of using modeled data? Thank you Andy. Great. Thanks, Francesca. And um, yeah, thank you also the previous speakers for setting this up nicely, especially <laughs> Linda, as I'm a geographer, so you've taken away some of that explanation. Um, but firstly, just to say what what actually is geospatial modeling in this context? Um, so I'm talking here about where we, we cannot physically count everybody. We cannot physically count everywhere all the time. Um, plus, there are many settings where administrative systems um, can be incomplete uh, or weak. Um, we don't sometimes have the, the exemplary systems that we've heard about from Jose and Federico. Um, and so uh, what we're talking about here is, is leveraging the, the wealth of spatially referenced data coming from all kinds of sources that Linda has just mentioned, from, from satellites, 
um, from GPS located surveys, um, from the, the from mobile phones um, to try and fill gaps um, and meet needs, whether that's disaggregation um, of population totals to smaller areas um, or producing new estimates. So um, that can be used for updated sample frames um, for delineating enumeration areas in preparation for physical data collection, um, for addressing issues of under enumeration um, or for producing small area intersensal estimates. Um, and we're really riding the, the wave of new forms of data from, from the satellite mapping of buildings, um, the, the AI detection and automated mapping of those, um, identification of neighbourhoods, informal settlements, infrastructure, um, to be able to do things like um, complete censuses in, in areas where there are inaccessible areas. For instance, uh, we've done engagements with Burkina Faso and Colombia where regions could not be reached, and these modelling approaches provided a way of producing those estimates. Um, for produce for making use of existing data from household survey listings. Um, examples include Cameroon and Papua New Guinea, where population estimates have recently been produced using those approaches. And uh, working with field teams to collect bespoke data on population estimates um, for training of these, these types of models. And there's a starting to be a growing acceptance in, and use among national statistical offices. Um, we've worked with around 20 different countries across Africa, Asia, Latin America and Caribbean and, and Europe. Um, but of course, we should not see this kind of estimation and modelling as a replacement or an excuse not to invest in the collection of, of what we say, real world population data, censuses and surveys. Um, those types of data are going to remain vital for ensuring that people are counted and that trust is built in systems and, and NSOs. Um, plus, such data are, are pretty vital for anchoring any types of modelling we do in, in reality and, and validating them. Um, nevertheless, there, there are still going to be constraints on budgets, resources, uh, geographical access uh, to be able to collect that types of data, and especially in conducting a national census. Uh, and we have seen these geospatial modelling approaches being adopted in multiple countries to fill gaps, supporting census preparation, tackling undercounts, uh, and providing intersensal estimates. And these, of course, bring risks um, in terms of providing perhaps an excuse to not invest in the collection of, of traditional real world data sources, um, producing inaccurate estimates if insufficient data are used as the basis of modeling. Um, there can be an inability to capture certain hard to reach groups, uh, and there can be a lack of trust and sustainability in those outputs if stakeholder co-development and engagement is, is not undertaken in producing these, these modelled estimates. Um, but on the other side, I think there are a lot of benefits in terms of savings of costs uh, in time in approaches to, to data production um, and preparations where, where limited alternatives and resources exist. And we have an ability to produce small area estimates with confidence intervals that are that are um uh, can be uh, of value in a situation where we, we have no other way of collecting data and they can be flexibly integrated with other sources of, of spatially referenced forms of data as we, we've heard from linda so thank you i will i will stop there Thank you, Andy. And uh, this is fascinating. And I'm sure that uh, our community uh, that's following us uh, will have questions for you too. Uh, I think that it's really a balancing act. Uh, uh, geospatial modeling uh, is vital now and may even become uh, more so in the near future. But then uh, we also all acknowledge as a community that the real data world uh, uh, world data, real life data needs to be um, uh, absolutely uh, collected or compiled uh, uh, because they are at the basis of your modeling, right? So for uh, well-informed uh, decision making. Okay, so let's go on. Uh, now I'm going to actually, I think uh, we have Eugenia, right? Eugenia is coming in. And uh, maybe we turn the focus on uh, uh, the prospects of technological advancement uh, and the use of alternative data for uh, improving population data systems. So, Eugenia, how has Meta uh, leveraged big data, artificial intelligence and machine learning uh, in their work related to population data? Thank you, Eugenia. 
Yeah, thanks so much, Francesca, for um, the question. And I, I thank now Andy for setting it up so nicely for me to follow up um, because I, I cannot agree more with the things um, he mentioned. Let me just quickly share my screen. Um, I basically want to, can you see my screen? Yes. So I want to walk you um, briefly uh, uh, through a few examples uh, that we do in our Data for Good program. Um, basically, our program aims to leverage Facebook uh, data or um, basically our apps data and tools to help humanitarian organizations and governments on, on different topics. Uh, we started with disaster response. We did a lot of work on COVID, um, climate change. Um, we did work on economic recovery, migration. So today I'm going to talk to you uh, specifically about how uh, a few examples of our uh, machine learning uh, algorithms to help on uh, population counts um, with uh, two of our, of our data sets. So the first one I'm going to talk about um, relates to what Andy was mentioning before. It's what we call the high resolution population density maps. These maps combine um, traditional data sources, in this case, is census data. Uh, we partner with Columbia University and they provide us uh, with the census data and census projections that they are um, the experts on. And what we did on our side is um, we grabbed satellite data and tried an algorithm to try to detect buildings at a very uh, granular level. So this is the uh, uh, area of 30 meters by 30 meters and we um, combine those uh, building estimates with the population estimates to, to create these micro estimates of populations at the 30 meter by 30 meter like kind of square. Um, so let me walk you quickly about like how this works um, so that you get a good intuition. So picture yourself on in a flight and you're looking through the window. Um, our eyes are very good at easily detecting where there are roads, where there are buildings. So basically we train um, thousands and thousands of images, satellite images, to do the same thing with a machine learning model. Basically, the algorithm can quickly detect where the buildings are. Um, and instead of like saying, okay, this whole area has 30,000 people, we're gonna grab those 30,000 counts and distribute them uniformly through the buildings. So it's like people normally build, <laughs> live where there are uh, structures. So we're gonna like assume that people are living in this square um, these purple squares instead of like throughout the area. This allows us to kind of like distribute people more efficiently and more granular um, in, in the population counts. This data set is public. Um, you can uh, access, you can get all the information in our Data for Good website. Um, and it has been used very widely um, by a lot of humanitarian organizations and governments. Uh, here, just one example of how it was used. Um, this is uh, uh, one of our partners who are interested in trying to understand how many, how many people were living uh, one kilometer away of a water point or five kilometers away or so on. So they, they could use our data and combine it with their data on water points to try to plan their operations and try to uh, help governments plan how they were going to uh, build new water points or water access. The second uh, data set that I want to talk about is what we call the Inter International Migration Atlas. Um, this is this has not been released. Is We're aiming to release it this year. We're kind of like finalizing the the, the details about them, but I want to give you like a, a quick sense of how it works. So the goal of this data set is to this this like the, the previous data set was combining census data and satellite data. This data set uses um, Facebook kind of like leverages Facebook data to try to estimate how many people are migrating uh, from one country to another country in a year. So we follow the definition of the UN of like having um, migrants have to live for you to be called a migrant you have to be based in one country for 12 months and then in another country for another 12 months so we use um algorithm it's called a segment based detection algorithm that has been published by one of my colleagues to try to understand when these jumps happen using um the estimates of the facebook app of where in which country you are based um, and this is done with a combination of signals from um your own uh, report of where you live, your IP, where you're connecting from, and so on. Um, so once we detect the number of people that are like 12 months in one place and 12 months in another place, we would like aggregate those counts up to the country level. 
And then we would have two other additional steps. The first one is that we would reweight our estimates. Um, so we don't want our estimates just to represent Facebook users. We want them to be more similar to general populations. So similar like uh, surveys reweight their their samples to make them representative of not just those like thousand people that were participating in the survey. We do the same thing to make our um, sample of Facebook users to be more representative of the general population. The second step we add is differential privacy. We want to. This is a technique. Um, it's probably the best technique to, to protect um, data and it aims to protect um, that nobody in our data set can be identified. So we add this differential privacy to our data set and then we release the data set externally. Here on the left you can see an image of how many people are moving from one region to the next. Um, just, just a quick peek of how, what our, this data set could do. This is like the number of migrants around the world. Uh, in millions and this is from January 2019 to October 2022 and you can see like a huge drop in uh, 2020 as you may imagine this is related to COVID and then the other interesting thing is here this peak of migration after January February 2022 most likely related to the Ukraine um, and Russia war. Um, so those are just two examples of how uh, we have been uh, using uh, machine learning algorithms, uh, Facebook data, other alternative data sources. And again, I cannot emphasize enough the importance of having traditional data sources for these efforts. We would not be able to create any of these data uh, sets without good census data, good survey data, because we need them many times to build our models or we need them to validate our models to make sure that what we're measuring is actually um, accurate. So uh, thank you so much. Thank you, Eugenia, and uh, I, I'd like just to invite uh, all of you, our speakers, to also take a look uh, as we go to the chat. Uh, there are some questions for you. We'll have time uh, to, to address them, uh, but just to make sure that uh, you, you take uh, into account uh, those questions in, in your answers. And uh, Eugenia, thank you for the two examples. I was a little familiar with the one on international migration, but the one on population density was new. And of course, a lot of questions. We would love to uh, you know, have uh, more details on how the, uh, these numbers were produced. And also many questions. That I'm ignorant on this, but how easy it is or how difficult it is to have access to satellite data, satellite images that would be for both uh, Eugenia and Andrew for countries who would like maybe to also learn uh, uh, how to uh, make use of those data for their estimates. But this is uh, for later. Let's uh, let's start our second round of questions and maybe I'll get back to Linda first. Uh, Linda, do you also want to come in and maybe comment on the pros and cons of artificial intelligence, intelligence and other advancements in technology? in the context yeah. of uh, improved population data. Thank you, Linda. Yeah, absolutely. And um, hopefully you can see my screen again. And and um, listening to what Eugenia had to say there, uh, obviously the advancements in technology are impacting all of our work, right? In, in the world of GIS, um, we're looking at those changes that are happening in so many different areas. It's happening in analytics, it's happening in visualization, storytelling right we have to communicate our information out and of course in the integration of uh, remote sensing and in the area of ai uh, in the area of spatial analytics and data science um, in particular it, it really is changing the way that we work and the way that we can work together we can collaborate now uh, much more easily than we used to be able to um, with other agencies with other science with other statisticians so um, tools such as uh, model builder or being able to work with notebooks you know um, scipy pandas you know all the tools that we're used to within a gis system really changes the way that we can think about our work and how we can engage with with others. And um, it's moving into the area of AI. Of course, everybody wants to know about AI. Um, and as we think about it, we've got to think about the different ways that we can use this, right? So um, generative AI really is about creating new data um, versus conversational AI, um, which is really made possible by natural language processing 
versus things like deep learning, which is a type of machine learning based on artificial neural networks. And so at Esri, again, we look at all of these different ways and we think about um, how it can be applied with GIS. And I'll, I'll start with the deep learning because at Esri, we've been doing work with deep learning and geo AI for many, many years. If, if you've been around at all, um, you're familiar with you know, this idea of feature extraction, right? Um, but today, using ArcGIS pre-trained pre deep learning models, um, we really help you eliminate the need for huge volumes of, of training data or massive compute, right? Um, the idea here is to um, use the AI knowledge and to accelerate your workflows with the resources that are designed for a specific task, for a specific image, for a specific feature to be extracted. And you can see the many examples on screen there. Um, it lets us do things like land cover classification or image redaction or detecting objects. And you can automate the way that you extract this information um, and really get meaningful insights from the imagery, from the point clouds, and even today from video as well. So again, at Esri, we're thinking about this um, in new ways. ArcGIS really is being infused with even more AI technologies. Um, we have many different deep learning models, as I mentioned, um, but we're also looking at how do we use these other tools? How do we use um, generative AI? How do we start to think about automating the way you extract meaningful insights from imagery as well? So. There's so much going on. AI combined with GIS really can help you accelerate intelligent decision making and insist in providing actionable recommendation, allowing you to create new information products. So we're working to improve the user productivity and efficiency and really deliver meaningful tools that will help you create insights derived from your data. It's really an exciting time, I think, to be in the world of statistics, you know, and, and data science. Thank you, Francesca. Perfect. Thank, thank you so much, Linda, uh, for adding uh, to the discussion on AI and linking it uh, uh, to um, geo AI and uh, and your work uh, at Esri. Um, let's go back to Federico and maybe let's move to another critical. Uh, element uh, uh, of uh, uh, the vision, I think, that we share for the future of population data systems uh, and the import importance of data governance. So Federico, how can national statistical systems uh, address data privacy and security concerns uh, while uh, enhancing data partnerships and access in an age of multiple data sources? Thank you, Francesca, for the question. I think um, nowadays NSOs has becoming um, in, in data hubs and has adopted a, a new role as data stewards. In the case of uh, INE of Uruguay, we have implemented our data strategy as data steward based on, on four pillars, uh, data discovery, data infrastructure, data interoperability, and data management. Um, and, and so transformations include implementing more rigorous security and personal data protection measures while um, incorporating more data sources and therefore having more dimensions for, for uh, analysis by, by researchers and, and, and users. Um, in this regard, uh, I, I would like to comment uh, NSI's experiences through consultations made to the Personal Data Protection Agency. This agency endorsed the procedures implemented by the NSI uh, of your way regarding the, the, the identification uh, or, or pseudo anonymization of the administrative registers that are integrated into the, the, the CD system that I, I commented during during my first in, intervention. Um, this gives us uh, important support and allows us uh, to continue to move 
forward with other institutions in terms of, of data access. Um, taking into account that releasing microdata, even anonymized, can be risky in, in terms of uh, preserving the confidentiality of the uh, information, even more so when dealing with uh, integrated systems of administrative registers with a large number of different variables. Uh, NSOs must think in, in, in different strategies for, 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 for data dissemination and, and access. So uh, an important instrument to do that is the micro uh, microdata laboratory which is an excellent option for researchers to, to access microdata in, in a safe and controlled environment. Um, the NSI uh, implemented a microdata laboratory and, and uh, this has encouraged the formation of collaborative projects uh, between academia, the private sector and the government. Um, they understand that if they share data with the NSI, it is a, a neutral actor with no interest in, in their businesses, um, they will have the opportunity to integrate data with new data sources that are adding value to them, so they will get more powerful insights. Uh, in, in, in this microdata lab, researchers use the microdata to, to make their analysis and research, but Outputs are not available for them until the uh, NSI employee makes a, a, a statistical exclusive control of the outputs and then enables the researcher to access to, to, to the output. And I, I, I would like to mention a, a recent example of collaborative project among Ministry of Interior, the NSI academia and private sector to produce statistics on marginalized, formerly incarcerated persons based on, on, on integration of different uh, administrative registers. And, and this is a, a very important and interesting project. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Federico. And uh, I like that you, you uh, shared uh, also specific examples and uh, uh, mentioning the microdata laboratory as uh, that's a control environment. It's where the way you uh, other collaborators and partners uh, can uh, work together, can uh, have access to micro level data. And it's also a cr critical way to improve collaboration uh, across all the many stakeholders uh, uh, you are working with. Uh, and that will be uh, key uh, players also in the uh, next generation population data systems, uh, hopefully in all countries. Uh, so maybe Andy, from your perspective, uh, you are the representative uh, from the academia with us today. Um, how can collaboration among uh, and the engagement of different stakeholders be improved based on your experience? Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, and I'm not sure I represent the whole of academia because that's <laughs> impossible. We're always arguing with each other, but um, yeah, I think I and I think thank you again to Lindia and Eugenia for, for um, laying out the, <laughs> the groundwork here in terms of some of the the, the types of uh, data and collaborations that um, we're, we're being able to make use of in terms of uh, the the advances in satellite imagery and in, in AI in geospatial processing um, and I think a few years ago I was more of a traditional academic maybe producing producing uh, population models outputs and putting them out there openly and ending up really just talking to other academics um, and I think uh, what's really changed recently is being able to, to partner with different UN agencies and to co-develop, um, strengthen capacity and hand over really local ownership of some of these approaches um, to foster trust uh, in, in these types of methods to ensure that we are producing and designing these, these types of spatial modeling approaches um, to meet the needs uh, and making use of the most appropriate data. Um, and often undertaking this research together. Um, there are often a, a lot of 
enthusiastic um, people within national stats offices who are keen to to learn these approaches and take them on. Um, something that's that's really been valuable as well in terms of getting these types of geospatial approaches adopted and used is is having as much as possible the data open, uh, the methods open and externally peer reviewed and validated provides both transparency to how data were used and what was undertaken, um, but also building trust. People can see what was done, what types of methods were undertaken and be able to replicate them where possible. Uh, and this kind of co-development, I think, has led led to quite a few successful engagements where we've had collaborations in, in the past and recently led led by, um, for instance, UNFPA, um, uh, a satellite bringing in satellite data providers, bringing in uh, other academics uh, and sometimes bringing in donors themselves. Um, it's led to, for instance, um, these types of geospatial estimation approaches that um, Eugenia presented being used as the basis now for, for government planning in terms of producing new estimates to fill in gaps in censuses in Colombia, in Burkina Faso. Um, we're seeing new estimates that are used for government planning now in Papua New Guinea through these types of uh, geospatial modeling approaches based on, on satellite data, on survey data. Um, we're seeing these types of data and estimates used in health campaigns um, for the, the Grid 3 program in the past uh, few years, working with the Nigeria government, with the Democratic Republic of Congo government, with Zambia. We've seen these data feed into vaccination microplans and uh, enable reaching uh, children under five who were just not not appearing on any maps previously um, because of the lack of recent census data. Um, we've also seen the adoption of these methods um, in building uh, regional communities of practice. So um, some fantastic work going on in the UNFPA LACRO region in terms of um, drawing, uh, drawing together different statistics offices who are supporting each other on, on population modelling methods to address undercounts, to prepare for new censuses and to produce intercensal estimates. And it's very exciting to see this kind of local ownership and adoption of these, these types of approaches um, ongoing. So, um, yeah, I think it's that kind of co-development that, um, that academia hopefully can play a role with and not be not be separated away in terms of a, an, an isolated set of academics talking to each other, but engaging um, with UN agencies, with um, uh, stakeholders and national statistics offices. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Andy. Absolutely. We, I think we all agree in this room uh, that we need uh, to all work together and uh, we are all striving to do that and moving away from our own silos and, and really reaching out. Uh, and uh, I also agree that having uh, a specific output uh, or a product uh, that is co-developed, uh, co-owned, uh, uh, with everybody on board uh, makes a huge difference. Uh, and also you touched on the importance of having uh, independent peer reviews, uh, both on the data that are used as well as uh, on the methods uh, to uh, build the trust on the final product. So this is uh, these are all very valid points uh, that um, I, I support completely. But uh, let's hear from Eugenia. Uh, so maybe the same question, more from uh, your side, uh, Meta, private sector. Yeah. Uh, how do we ensure partnerships and uh, stakeholders engagement? Thank you. Yeah, I, I totally agree um, with what Andy was saying. Um, I think that, so for us, we spent about like, let's say two years building a data set. Um, and this includes kind of like a lot of different steps, right? So we hear there is a need on migration data. So it's like, okay, how do you find migration? What data do we use? How do we validate it? Um, it's kind of like a, a very long process. And it, it's, it makes a huge difference if we develop it alone or if we develop it with the experts on the ground. And this uh, matters in, in a few of different things. So the first one is um, early on, like first on kind of like how we're going to, what methodology we're going to use, like how are we going to measure this? Um, we we released once a data set. We have a, um, a few data sets um, that are for disaster response. And this mostly uh, aimed to help organizations that want to know where people are moving to, how many people, like what part of a city lost connection or so on. <clears throat> and one of our partners, the um, Internal Displacement Monitoring Center, 
came to us and say like, look, this, these numbers on displacement don't make sense. I was like, great, <laughs> tell us about it. <laughs> and, and, and that was kind of like a huge like, learning experience for us. And we, after that, we kind of like work with them. We would meet weekly to improve the methodology. And, and that created us like the opportunity to, to a, build something. If, as I said, it's like if, if, we're build, if we're working on this for two years, the worst scenario for us is that we're going to build something that nobody's going to use, <laughs> right? So that's like, we want to avoid that. So for us to avoid that was like, this was a, like a great experience, right? We would like meet weekly, show them like results, say like, hey, what if we like measure this? What if we exclude this uh, type of data? Like, what do you think about this disaster? Does this make sense with what you're seeing on the ground? So it's like kind of like that feedback loop is central for building something that is going to be used and to create trust. Um, the other uh, part where the, the relationship is really important is to validate our uh, estimates. So one of the main challenges that we have is that we create data sets because there is a data gap, because this data doesn't exist. So we try to leverage our um, data or our technologies to, to, to help uh, kind of like provide another data source. But because this data doesn't exist in the real world, it's very hard for us to validate it, right? It's like, what are we going to compare? Like, let's say, migration flows like there are there is data on the world <laughs> on migration flows but many times it comes from countries that are richer have better like statistical offices have better like kind of like administrative data and like does that mean that if we do well comparing to those are we doing well with the, th those that are that don't have the data like poorer countries it's kind of like it's very hard for us to like get the trust that uh, we're doing a good job and especially because our data is to be global um so so validating and kind of like Talking to the experts on the ground on how our data looks like is, is also key. Um, I totally agree on the third point of um, publishing our, our uh, methodologies. So we aim to publish in peer reviewed journals um, so that we get feedback from the experts in academia on how this is done. Many times I, I, academics also participate on like developing the methodology or like on providing us like their expertise, like in the example of the population density maps and our collaboration with Columbia. Um, but like publishing is another example to add transparency and help people trust uh, what we're doing. Um, methodologies, you can have like many different types of methodologies. We might get it like we may choose things that other people would not choose, but getting kind of like a check that what we're doing is reasonable is is kind of like a, a key step. Um, and then the last thing uh, is, um, yeah, kind of like combine, combining data sources. Right, like being able to talk to those that produce the traditional data sources and say, like, hey, how does this compare to your estimates? Um, does this make sense? We're overestimating here compared to you. Why this could be? Why this cannot be? It's kind of like so building these relationships um, and comparing traditional data sources to non-traditional data sources is key because many governments and agencies are just used to the traditional data sources. So it's like they they need to trust that the new one relates to the traditional or it's like or why is it different and kind of like and have an explanation for that thank you thank you so much i think we are all agreeing that this is a critical ingredient for the future population data systems right we need to be able to work together and Eugenia, yes, you need uh, the, this feedback loop uh, with the experts uh, on, on specific uh, thematics. Uh, you mentioned the international migration, and I'm sure that you are also involving uh, not just academia, but also the national statisticians, uh, so government officials who will have the hands-on type of experience on this type of data. Uh, we really look forward to the uh, final results. Uh, you show us a little bit of the millions uh, per month uh, over a few years, uh, but I remember also seeing some big number floating at one point, uh, so very much interested uh, in seeing this work published. Uh, and we look forward to working uh, with, with you with you all. Um, let's uh, conclude. I have one last question uh, for uh, Jose. So we go back to Statistics Canada and maybe Jose, you can help us uh, in uh, also, getting back to the basic, uh, we didn't talk so much about population housing censuses and survey programs. It links well also with what Eugenia just said, right? And uh, also Andy, we need to have uh, uh, um, real data also for any uh, AI and machine learning modeling, etc. So um, what's the future of population housing censuses and survey programs, considering their centrality to popula population data systems in the majority of countries. Thank you, Jose. 
Thank you, Francesca. Uh, first, um, other panelists have showed this morning how technical, technological uh, innovation is creating new sources of data and tools to process and analyze them. So my first point is around how this is changing um, expectations about pace and delivery of disaggregated data. As a national statistical agency, we need to continuously work on leveraging the technological advancements that are happening, such as adopting AI, to ensure that we remain on the leading edge of change. National statistical offices no longer hold a monopoly on collecting, analyzing, and releasing national data. And it's getting harder for people to identify what data they can trust. In fact, in 2023, 59% of Canadians age 15 and older said that they were very or extremely concerned by online misinformation. And overall, 46% felt that it was getting harder to distinguish factual information from fiction compared to 2020. So trust must be at the forefront of any st uh, national statistical system. And this goes to the heart of the question. The census is still the touchstone, the way we evaluate the quality of other uh, data sources. It's used not just by national statistical uh, offices um, to set sampling frames, um, to weight uh, smaller data sets. So protecting our data is integrated into uh, every, uh, every activity at Statistics Canada, whether it's collection of individual data, access to data, or disseminating uh, detailed local results. And our ongoing efforts have been recognized. In 2018, um, there was a public opinion survey from ECOS showing that nearly nine in 10 Canadians trust Statistics Canada. So this trust translates into cooperation. 98% of Canadians complete the census every five years, and the majority gives us permission to access their income tax records for financial data. While response rate to our census, which is mandatory, are high, the same cannot be said for our, our voluntary surveys. Canadians are busy people, it's harder to reach them, and survey costs are rising. So lower response rates are a major challenge, not just for Statistic Canada, but for many national statistical offices as well. And to respond to that challenge, this is where we need to consider the right mix of surveys and other data sources while still meeting policymakers' needs. There are some questions, for example, um, subjective measures such as self-rated mental health or overall life satisfaction that you just need to ask people. You, you cannot find that kind of information in, in other sources of information. So surveys matter uh, a great deal. But as a national statistical agency, we also need to avoid complacency and path uh, dependency. So Statistic Canada, as I mentioned before, is using data linkage, uh, data linkages and making better use of administrative data, modeling, and as well uh, uh, using uh, machine learning models. Administrative data offer tremendous powers, uh, power and insight into social trends, but there is some discomforts about how national statistical agency collect and use them. And that's why engagement is so important. We need to work transparently to build trust not just in our results, but in our ways of working. We consult to develop framework, uh, frame, multiple frameworks like our quality guidelines, the quality assurance framework, the fundamental uh, principles of official statistics, the importance of data ethics, international standards, and the responsible machine learning framework, and many others. I'd like to finish by talking about our Census Future Initiative. Um, we are asking questions in the upcoming 2024 Census test, so that's in preparation of our 2026 20, Census. 
uh, where we are going to test the social license for greater use of administrative data in the 2031 census. Uh, Statistics Canada is also developing innovative and robust methods for linking administrative data files to enhance its statistical programs and reduce the burden on Canadians. We're also evaluating the quality of population counts at both the individual and household level and devising techniques to measure census concepts, starting primarily with administrative data. Simulation of census outcomes using um, linked administrative files and modeling techniques are yielding promising results. And with each simulation, the methods are refined to enhance uh, accuracy and striving to match the precision of traditional census results. And I'll stop here, Francesca, thank you. Thank you, thank you so much, Jose. And uh, without further ado, let's give the floor to Alessio. Uh, as our discussant uh, to make sense of uh, everything that has been uh, said so far and we should still have uh, maybe 10 minutes uh, for uh, uh, open uh, questions. Uh, please, Alessio. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Francesca, and thanks everybody for the, for the very insightful and, and inspiring discussion. Um, in, in my intervention, I will, I will try to emphasize some key points that the panelists made, uh, hopefully providing some complementary reflections. Um, as mentioned by Francesca, uh, UNFPA has been working on a, on a forthcoming paper on the future of population data systems with uh, contributions from um, a number of experts. So what I'm going to say draws upon some of the key uh, messages offered by this paper uh, with a focus on, on low and middle income countries that make up the, the, the vast majority of um, UNFPA's constituency. Um, I'd, I'd like to start from the general observation that uh, as we prepare for the future of population data, we need to understand the evolving uh, landscape of data needs. Um, despite much progress in data system strengthening, gaps persist in the availability, quality, accessibility, and, and use of data, in particular disaggregated data on, on key subpopulations. Key examples include the limited availability of, of data to track sustainable development goals five on gender equality, for example. Um, we talked about migration data, the difficulty to reconcile migrant stocks with migration flows, uh, maternal and other cause of death data, and data on some of the hardest to reach groups, uh, such as um, people with non-binary gender identities, persons with disability, Afro-descendant people, indigenous groups, etc. As, as we look to the future, we see global megatrends that are reshaping our world and are also increasingly creating new data needs. So, for example, on the impact of the climate crisis on livelihoods, health and mobility, uh, on the determinants of healthy aging over the life course, on the impact of technology on human well-being, just to, just to name a few. So, I, I guess the first point I really want to make is that the demand for population data has been growing. It will continue to evolve with changes in societal dynamics, and this creates significant pressures on national data systems uh, to adapt, evolve, and, and stay ahead of the curve. Um, I want to emphasize um, the point, the last point that um, uh, Jose made about uh, the importance to sustain traditional statistical collections. In lower income countries in particular, lacking fully fledged administrative data infrastructures, the, the precondition for, for a full transition to register based methodologies are unlikely to be met in the short term future. Um, it can be anticipated that in the in the 2030 round, uh, field based population and housing censuses will continue to serve as a key pillar of population data systems. In, uh, I, I want to I want to give you a figure uh, that the world population is expected to grow by about 700 million over the next decade. 600 million will live in low and middle income countries where field-based enumeration will continue to be the main method of data collection. So if we don't conduct censuses, we, we risk that a very large uh, part of this additional 700 people on our, on, on our planet will remain unaccounted for. Of course, household service will continue to play also an important role um, in the collection of self-reported data, as, as reminded by, by, by Jose. We heard that the continuous reliance on, on, on census and service will be affected by numerous challenges. 
uh, including high costs and, and declining coverage. Uh, cost cutting pressures uh, on statistical agencies will most likely continue. And in an area of uh, stunted economic growth, prospects for significantly expanding donor support for development data are also limited. So it will be necessary to develop effective domestic financing mechanisms and adopt alternative methods that generate cost efficiencies. As we look forward, however, this may not be sufficient. Uh, it would be very important to ensure that the benefits of conducting uh, censuses and surveys are well understood uh, to establish the political will and the political support for the 2030 census round. We heard a lot about uh, data systems integration and um, as, as a key pathway towards optimizing population data systems. We know there is no one fits all approach uh, that applies to all countries, uh, but there are a few general principles that I want to emphasize here. The first is uh, that um, integrating and aligning administrative data systems is not just a technical exercise for the sake of statistical production. It's about enhancing the functions of state governance. Ultimately, this will require a whole of government and whole of society approach, approach to population data systems based on the principle that this is the foundation of a more efficient state governance. Uh, the second, and, and we heard uh, uh, already this uh, mentioned several times by uh, both by Federico and by Jose, integration, not just across administrative registers, but between administrative data, censuses, surveys, and other forms of data. Um, we heard multiple examples of how this has already been done in a number of countries, and these offer multiple advantages for, for the quality and efficiency of data generation processes. And the third one is really the importance of data integration to break the silo between humanitarian and development data ecosystems. With frequent and protracted humanitarian crisis, it is critical to bridge this humanitarian development divide by furthering the integration between census, civil registration, displacement tracking systems, rapid field assessment, and geospatial data to track and address population impacts during, during crisis. When it comes to one fundamental aspect um, highlighted by, by Linda, by Andy, that the importance of, of geospatial statistical integration, there are two things that I would like to emphasize here from a UNFPA perspective, supporting countries conducting censuses in particular. And one is the need to enhance access um, and affordability of recent high resolution satellite imagery for census mapping. This, this is still a bottleneck for, for many countries in, in low middle income countries particularly. And this is an area where the UN could play an important role. For example, uh, helping generate economies of scale when uh, multiple countries in the region are conducting censuses at the same time. And the second is the importance of, of strengthening capacities for the release of gridded census data as one of the important census outputs for, for the future, um, which is an effective way to promote the use of census in combination with other uh, sources of geospatial data or for multiple geospatial mapping um, applications. We heard a lot about um, uh, use of alternative sources of data and the contribution, the potential for expanding this um, as, a, as a main pillar of the, of the national data systems. Uh, we heard that it's fundamental to build partnership and co-development to take advantage of this expanding realm of, uh, of data sources, as this does not only require more effective systems for data sharing, but, uh, but also new competencies and, and increasingly interdisciplinary expertise uh, statistics, geography, IT, uh, data science, and et cetera, to, to better assess representativeness, uh, biases, conduct validation research, and particularly through triangulation with, with traditional data sources. A clear message was also conveyed about the importance of strong data governance to ensure that uh, standards are established with, with requisite protections for, for privacy, data ownership, cybersecurity, enabling secure modes of data sharing, uh, ensuring standards and representativeness, but also informed consent of data reuse, and also to mitigate the risks of, of misuse amplified by AI-powered algorithm. Um, 
I want to conclude by emphasizing that uh, what we are seeing today is, you know, as as practitioner in in, in population data uh, institutions is is really a diversity of pathways to the future. We are clearly seeing that population data systems are in a state of flux, will continue to be shaped by resource constraints, operational constraints, behavioral change, emerging data needs, and of course the the tremendous opportunities, but also challenges offered by digitization and technological innovation. It is fundamental to recognize that countries are at very different stages of data transformation and may require different pathways in their journey to a future ready population data uh, ecosystem. Therefore, it is, is it important for, for global statistical framework and international institutions to be inclusive and responsive to the needs of countries that may be prioritizing different pathways to modernize their national data ecosystems and address inequality in statistical uh, capacity. Thank you very much for this opportunity and over to you, Francesca. Okay, thank you so much. I think you did an excellent job, Alessio, in putting all the pieces together and definitely uh, there will not be one solution uh, fits all, uh, but I think that, you know, today the, the the goal was to highlight some of the key characteristics uh, in this uh, shared uh, vision for uh, um, population data systems in the near future. I also like that you touched, and I think you're the only one, uh, on the need to better link uh, and talk about the humanitarian and the development systems, also from a data and the statistical perspective, uh, particularly given the increase in all sorts of crises. So the, the two worlds of data will need to be better integrated and connected. But uh, having said that, let's uh, have a, a few minutes, uh, seven, ten minutes uh, to go through the many questions that have been asked in the chat. I already acknowledge that some of our speakers, uh, they were listening and they were also uh, taking care of answering uh, questions that were directed to them. So that's lovely. Um, but uh, if anyone uh, in the room and you are many, I think uh, there are 230 people or so. If you want to uh, unmute yourself, if that's allowed, maybe someone in uh, NSD needs to tell me if that's a, a possibility. Uh, can they unmute themselves? Can they raise their hand? Yeah, they can unmute themselves. You can unmute yourself. You so uh, you Please recognize. raise your hand and then we'll enable your microphone. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay, uh, we have uh, um, Ortigosa. I don't see your full name, apologies. You can unmute yourself. Yeah, I'm already unmute. Anna, Hello, okay. uh, good morning. I'm Anna good Ortigosa morning. from Pan American Health Organization. Um, well, we are most uh, based on uh, looking for disaggregation in health data uh, systems, but I think this conversation is also very appropriate for uh, the future of data systems in population in general. I want to, you know, I, I think I was very amazed by the many the many opportunities integrating data systems have, but I think there was a, a little touch on uh, the governance piece and uh, the how to make this possible, right? There might be, as, as Alessio, I think, introduced many challenges in different countries, particularly in Latin America, where we are trying to digitalize health is also a challenge. So, uh, but one of the most concerning things in terms of ethics is how we integrate or we use this data for the the people we are trying to retrieve the data, particularly in, in cases of um, minority groups. So, how I would like to ask to all the panels how they can have considered um, the governance or the agency of people or groups or communities uh, in in terms of using and and doing stewardship of of this data. I think is that not sure is the clear, but that's my my question, main question. Thank you, thank you, Anna. Maybe quickly, just one uh, additional question, and then we go around the room, and I think uh, that will be it. But there are there is still the opportunity for you uh, to to respond to the questions that were uh, directed to you. Anybody else? One, two, three. No. So who wants to start? Linda, you look uh, ready. Oh, thanks, thanks, Francesca. Yeah. Uh, again, I, I think about um, 
governance and I think about the stewardship of the data, and this is why it's so important to tie things to location. So uh, there was another question earlier as well that talked about displaying historical changes in population, right? If we want to be able to do things like that and, and do longitudinal studies and have um, trust and confidence in our data, then we have to be able to have common geographies and to be able to tie things together. And again, I think by using um, the systems uh, you know, that we have today, the tools that we have today, um, we can ensure the accuracy of the data. And it takes a uh, thought to do that as a statistician, especially when we're looking at small area geography, right? And when we're starting to, to try and understand things like that and keep things like privacy in mind. But the tools are there for us to do it. It really is more about the governance and how we manage that. Thank you, Linda. Um, uh, Federico, I think you touched a little bit uh, on, uh, on also your role as data steward uh, uh, at NSO. Please. You are muted. Federico, can you hear me? Oh, yeah. Sorry, no, I couldn't. Sorry. Yes, do you want to elaborate a little bit on this question on uh, data governance? Uh, yeah, I, I think, it, I, as I mentioned in, the, in, in, in my presentation, uh, uh, yes, NSO uh, have become a data steward and, and, and uh, um, other, other um, in this role, the, 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 the NSI concerns about the, the data security issues and also and in and, 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 and integrating different um, data sources. So, uh, and we are not, it's, it's, it is not our business to, 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 to uh, use, uh, I mean, uh, the, the data for, for uh, um, the purposes that, that, that they, 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 the data owners have, but um, uh, it allows uh, the researchers to uh, integrate different um, Data sources, and we can provide the access um, uh, to more dimensions uh, for them. So it, it, it is a, a good uh, uh, collaborative uh, um, initiative to uh, um, to use the NSO as um, data hub, and and and, and uh, also to add value to this information. I mean, uh, uh, incorporating. Uh, standards and quality checks that the NSO uh, used to 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 have in, in different statistical operations. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Federico. So data stewards, but also data hub. Um, maybe uh, Eugenia. Yeah, um, we spend a lot of time thinking about data privacy and how to protect the data of our users, particularly when we use data that is related to our apps. Um, and if we're going to release a data set publicly, it has to meet the highest criteria of data privacy, and that's when we add differential privacy. We also have um, access control data sets for data sets where if we add so much noise, they would be meaningless, but they are still relevant for these situations like disasters. So if we add too much noise for a disaster, the, like the information would not like be relevant, right? Because it's kind of like smaller populations moving in real time. Um, so for those, we have data access and only people um, that are only basically humanitarian organizations can access that data. Uh, so, so we, that's another way to kind of like add a control of how the data is used. Um, and, and we, we, like a third option was like, for instance, we were reached, um, the data for a good program was reached by those working with the Ukraine refugee crisis. Basically the main problem that they had is that they had great data on how many people were leaving Ukraine, how many people were entering the European Union, but then they didn't know whether that people were staying in Poland, going to Germany, moving to Spain. So they came to us and kind of like we together uh, made a decision to leverage our data that we would have about um, movements of, of people. Um, but the data was so sensitive that we only, um, only 
uh, we didn't give any kind of like data for people to analyze. We analyzed it, aggregated it up, and then gave the insights um, to the people working on the ground. These insights were like extremely valuable because many times they need to plan campaigns on where to give resources to women or where to give um, where there were going to be hundreds and hundreds of kids coming that needed to start a school year. Um, so keeping that information felt bad, right? It's like it's it's extremely valuable in that moment. But we need to consider the privacy of, of, of the users and the vulnerability of these populations. So we're kind of like trying to always evaluate the risk of these populations with the privacy and the value. Uh, and, and there is no just one formula <laughs> to it. It's kind of like a, a difficult process. And we try to make those decisions together with the people of the humanitarian organizations working on the ground, um, just kind of like to take their expertise of whether we should be doing this Perfect. Thank you so much, Andrew. Andy. Um, yeah, what would you like me to, <laughs> to add to this? <laughs> up to you. Um, you can also just have your, uh, you know, one minute uh, wrap up. Uh, if right. there is anything yeah. you really want uh, to, to highlight and share with, uh, with the group. Thank you. No, I, I, I was just typing in an answer to one of the questions about in, involving community knowledge, um, community engagement and just presenting an example there from from um, yeah our collaborations with Dane where the the um, the modeled just the use of satellite data produced okay estimates uh, bringing in the community knowledge uh, from hard to access regions really Im improved things and so it's that it's that message again of integration of different sources of data different angles um, with not just reliant on these is new forms of data, but to, to to tie them to not only the official statistics, but bringing in community expertise in 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 some areas where where official statistics can be hard to to collect. So, um, thank you. A, a link in there. Thanks. Thank you, Andy. And uh, Jose, you got the last word. Thank you, Francesca. So, if I if I get the last word, then. I will say one word that comes to mind is more. Um, I think that policymakers, as we've discussed, are needing data, more data about people, about who they are, where they live, how they are doing, what they are doing, and they need this in a more frequent way, more granular way, and more timely. And as we said earlier, you know, there are so costs associated with that. So we are cost constrained, but that means prioritization uh, and finding that right balance between survey and statistical programs and administrative data linkages and modeling while um, while still satisfying the needs of our users. Thank you. Thank you, Jose. And uh, thank you all uh, from my side. My last word, and then I let you go, is that as usual, we have so much to discuss and so little time to go uh, over all the different uh, points and steps and to unpack them properly. But the good news is that this is just the beginning of this discussion on the future of population data systems. Um, in a couple of weeks, we have the UN Statistical Commission where we will discuss further uh, uh, population data systems, uh, particularly in the context of uh, population housing censuses. Uh, we also have an agenda item on this friends of the chair on the future of social and demographic uh, uh, statistical systems, uh, very much related. And uh, please also uh, take a look once it's available to Alessio's uh, and UNFPA report on the future of population data systems, because I believe that will also be a very valuable uh, piece uh, for all of us to reflect on uh, and uh, uh, meet again soon uh, to further discuss uh, uh, this important uh, um, fundamental uh, element of any national statistical system. So with that, thank you. Thank you all. Thank you, our uh, expert uh, panel. And uh, we'll see you all uh, very soon, I hope. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank Bye. you. Bye-bye. Thank you.